that if each and every one of you could make it here this morning. I look forward to a good time together in the Lord's house. A couple of things uh, just to announce and a reminder of. January 4th to the 8th is the youth camp. And uh, so if you do not have a flyer for that and you like one, please see me. Um, it's it's going to be a good week of camp. Uh, by the way, uh, there is a new surprise that they've just added to camp. And if you want to know what it is, you'll have to come to find out. Uh, there's going to be some a new fun activity uh, that we'll be able to have available one morning, or willing. And then uh, this is, if you'd like to register um, for youth camp, uh, you just go on the church's website underneath ministries. There's youth camp. Uh, just click on that, and, and off you can go registering for youth camp and and paying your registration fees and all that, it's all done um, off the church website. Brother Harry has done a wonderful job uh, getting that registration form all online. And this week we've been testing out another new thing. Uh, pretty soon, maybe even as early as next Sunday, um, you know how we have the connection cards, the visitor's cards. Uh, pretty soon we have all that ready to go, that, that will be digital, so that way someone We'll have in front of the visitor seats, we'll have a little QR code that they just scan it with their phone. They can fill out the, the visitor's card information and uh, request a visitor for a call from the pastor or an email for information and click submit and do it all that way. And uh, he's done a lot of wonderful work um, helping the church in that way. And so I just want to thank him for that. And, and so the Lord provides people for that. Also with camp, um, those who do need um, some help or are trying to raise some funds um, to be able to go to camp, on the welcome table, right where you check in, uh, there is a Biggie fundraiser order form. Uh, they're back. Uh, if you want to order them, it's $10 a dozen. You can order them cooked or frozen balls of dough uh, with instructions on how to cook them yourself. Um, and then you can circle. There's... Three dates in three Sundays in November, three Sundays in December, um, that you can receive those. Uh, those will be made, brought to church, ready for you to pick up. Um, and we've added a new thing. There's chocolate chip, oatmeal raisins, strawberry jam drops, and white chocolate and cranberries. There's a, a new one in the lot uh, for you. And so there you go. If you'd like to do that, the proceeds to anything that comes in from that. Uh, we'll go to helping some young people go to camp and some things going on with the camp. And um, you can do that if you have a Christmas work Christmas get together coming up or something. Need to bring something? Good thing to do that with. And uh, one other announcement real quick before we pray. Um, you can still turn in your missions Faith Promise Commitment card. Just fill it out if you need one. I have some more I can give you. And then drop that in the missions offering box. Uh, we'll add that to the existing totals uh, of our Faith Promise Missions Giving each month. Right now, uh, the Faith Promise Missions Giving commitment for this year is sitting just below $1,350 a month. And so that's exciting. We saw some increase in that last week. And if you haven't turned yours in, but you'd like to be involved in that, uh, please turn that in. And we will uh, see what the Lord will have us be able to do for missions this year. And to be able to reach the world with the gospel. So uh, let's go to the word, Lord, the word of prayer. And Brother June will come and I'll lead us in some songs. Father, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, we thank you for the privilege that we have to assemble together as your family here, as your body, in this local lo location. And Lord, we thank you for each person that's able to be here. There's a number who may be not sick or for various reasons are not able to be here this morning. Uh, may you be with them, strengthen them, bring them back to us safely. Uh, move this time together as we spend uh, singing and worshiping you. And Lord, also as we study your word, may you be honored and glorified through it all. May we leave this place knowing you in a better way and better equipped to be a witness for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
children's story time. Remember how we say, uh, listen and pay attention to stories, some themes repeat themselves and you can uh, see where people get it from. And also, uh, this morning in adult and teen growth group, we were talking about some different things and we, we mentioned that a lot of times our children learn from watching us and they model what they've seen, correct? Uh, you're going to see that evident in a Bible story uh, this morning, because we're going to be talking about how Jacob deceives Isaac, all right? And it's interesting things that take place here. So, uh, Jake, Jacob was, I mean, Isaac was getting older, and he was a bit up in years, and as he was getting older, he began to lose his eyesight, and he couldn't quite see well. Now, if someone has something like that, it's not nice to take advantage of them because they can't see well. Uh, but you'll see that that's what exactly happens. 
And remember how um, we said that Esau was a hunter. He was a hairy guy, and he was a hunter. And he liked to hunt things. He was good at it. But remember, we also said he was very concerned with his belly. Yeah? Because remember, he sold his birthright for a bowl of stew. Now, remember I said to remember some things. Because he was very concerned with his belly. And I'll tell you this. He got it from somewhere. You say, why? Because Jacob, I mean, Isaac was old. And he couldn't see well. So he calls in Esau. And he says, Esau, my son, I know you're a great hunter. And I really like the food you cook and that you prepare from the animals that you kill when you dress them and all that. And now I'm old and I'm going to die soon. But before I die, one more time, I want to eat uh, something that you've killed and dressed for me. Huh, what does it sound like he was very concerned with before he died? A good feed, right? Filling his belly. You wonder where Esau got that from. It doesn't, it doesn't take too much to figure that one out. I don't know about you, but if I'm about to die, I'm not sure my biggest concern would be filling my stomach. Because uh, I don't think that, maybe, I don't know. I mean, hey, if you're going to go out, go out full and happy, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but here we are, and this is where we are. So... Uh, Esau says, no worries, Dad. I will go kill you a nice animal, and I will dress it, and I will bring you back a big feast, and that way, you know, I'll honor you in that way. Well, overhearing that was Rebecca. And Rebecca went, oh, so you're going to bless him when he feeds you. Okay. Huh. Jacob, dear, come here. I've got a plan. Your brother has gone to hunt and to dress an animal and to feed it to your father a good meal. Can you go get me two goats from the field? Because I can dress them and I can cook them and I know just how dad likes it. And then I'm going to send you in and you're going to give the meal because we can get it faster than Esau can hunting. And then he's going to bless you and not Esau. And what God told me would come to pass, I'll help him out. Okay, haven't we already learned from other people we've studied already in the book of Genesis that helping God out tends to problems? Greg, remember... Um, before with Abraham and Sarah, Sarah tried to help God out with Hagar, and we're still suffering the consequences of that today. So here's the plan. So he goes and he says, uh, but mom, I got, they got a problem. I, I can get the food and you can dress it and you can cook it up just how dad likes it, but um, my brother's hairy and has a unique smell that I know dad can't see well but all he has to do is touch me and I'm not hairy. Isn't that a pretty obvious thing if someone's really hairy and you touch them? It's like, oh, no. She goes, uh, don't worry about it. Go to your brother's tent, get some of his clothes, and then when we kill the goats, I will take the furry skins and I'll put them around your neck and I'll put them around your arms and that way when dad touches you, you're hairy. Now, I don't know about you, but this plan is sounding like all sorts of problems, does it not? But what does Jacob do? Okay. Let's go do it. And so he goes and gets it, and she kills it, they kill it, and dress it, and cook it. And he's wearing Esau's clothes, so that way he kind of has the aroma of his brother. And he's wearing uh, the dead goat skin furry hide. Fastened to his arms and neck and body. And he goes in and presents. He comes in and he says, Father, I have that meal for you. And Esau's like, I mean, Jacob's like, Isaac is, wow, that was quick. God must have been with you to be able to find an animal that quickly and get it back. And, oh, yes, yes, he was. Now, here's the meal. Eat it and then bless me. 
And so he eats it. Jacob gives him the blessing. And uh, he leaves the tent. And no sooner than he leaves the tent, guess who comes back from hunting? Esau. He's got the animal. And he's coming all in. And he gets it all dressed. And he cooks it all up. And he goes to his father's tent door and says, Father, I'm here with the meal that you requested. And dad goes up. If you're here with the meal that I requested, who was here with the meal that I already blessed? <coughs> and do you think it was real hard to figure out? He was mad. Not only had his brother took his birth right away, but now he's taken the blessing away as well. He was upset. And you know what? Esau said, you know what? I can't give you the blessing blessing, but I will still bless you. And so he puts his hands on him and he gives him the blessing. In other words, he can't leave every, a lot of stuff to him and it's not like he's the next in line and all that type of stuff anymore. But he doesn't bless him. Well, how do you think that made Esau feel? Do you think he loved his brother? Do you think he's, he's, his brother was his favorite person in the world? No. He said, you know what? When dad, I won't do it when dad's alive. But when dad's dead, he won't be the only funeral in the family. I'm going to kill my brother. But I won't do it while dad's alive. And so instead of that, we'll just have a double funeral. You know, back to back. That'll be okay. Well... Rebecca hears about it and goes, Jacob, Jacob, now Jacob, Jacob, son, this didn't turn out how we were expecting. You might want to get out of town. Because if you don't get out of town, and when dad passes, Esau is going to kill you. And I don't want that to happen, so please leave. So where are we going to leave the story today? Jacob is now running for his life. Because he listened to a mom who tried to help God out. By the way, God doesn't need help, but he, that's what happened. Now there's division in the family. There's strife in the family. One brother wants to kill the other brother. Dad's about to die, and Jacob is running for his life. And if you want to know what happens, you come back. But again, remember the stories about how, Jake, uh, how Jacob tricked Isaac. Because just like the feeling the belly came back again, it's going to come back again. And remember, the old biblical principle, you reap what you sow. We'll see that in a, in a, in a story or two, okay? And so uh, hopefully uh, you can be learning some things from these Bible stories and putting some things together in your mind. And they can be a help to you as we study them out together. And uh, now we're going to have our scripture reading. And um, we're going to have, uh, the day is going to come. And so I believe if you open your Bible to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, if I remember right, I was reading verses 11 and 12. Please turn your Bible to the book of 1 Thessalonians 3, 4 to 11 and 12. First Thessalonians 4, chapter, verse 11 and 12. And that ye study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to do, your, to do work with your own hands, as we command you, that ye, man, walk honestly toward them that we are not without, and that we may have lack of nothing. <laughs>
chapter 5, 2 Kings chapter 5, we uh, look at that passage of scripture uh, this morning. It is said, for every uh, New Testament principle, there is an Old Testament illustration. And so the New Testament principle about being living honestly about those that are without, and testimony, and things of that nature, uh, we will be seeing that illustrated in an Old Testament story. If you have those that are four and under and they'd like to be dismissed at Children's Church, uh, they can be, that can be dismissed at this time. Alright. Now, we're going to be starting a new, a, diff, a different series. We, we did the, the Power of Influence and we were going to be doing three messages on that. And I had said about the influence of Elisha over Joash. But here's the problem. Elisha didn't influence the Joash of Judah. He influenced the Joash of Israel. And so remember how I said it's confusing because names keep switching back and forth. Uh, so I'm not going to preach a message that didn't happen. Does that make sense? Good idea, right? Yes. We're going to preach a message and make sure it happened in the Bible. Hey, it may be good preaching, but not a good idea to make it out. All right. And so we're not going to do that. So we're going to move on. And, and uh, this series we're going to look at is there's an app for that. Applications worth living by. Now, how we're going to do this is we're going to be selecting Bible characters that we'll be doing a study of that are either little known or we don't even know their name. Uh, characters in the Bible that, oh yeah, we may know their name, but we don't know a lot about them. Or character, there are a lot of characters in the Bible who did great things when they appear in the pages of Scripture. But who are they? We don't know. And so there are some applications for a lot to live by by looking at these little known or unknown Bible characters. First one we're going to look at uh, illustrates the idea of being uh, well known or a good testimony to those that are without, as we looked at in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So in 2 Kings chapter 5, we're just going to read a few short verses, and then we'll kind of walk through this passage of Scripture uh, together. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in battle, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. 
And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is, that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. One went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is out of the land of Israel. The king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. And he went and brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive, that this man to send me unto me to recover a man of leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray to you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. We'll stop reading right there in a moment. And so, here we have this young lady. I mean, think about it. She was taken from Israel captive. She was a slave. How would you react as a, as a, if your young child was ripped out of your home, pulled into a foreign country, and made to serve a general's wife in that army? Another thought. How much training have you done to teach that child about God that even if that were to happen, they still seek God, they still know God's in control, they still know God can heal, and they're still pointing people to Him. Well, here's what we have. You say, well, what's this young lady's name? This little lady's name? We don't know. We just know her as a little lady. And there she was taken away, and she's serving, minding her own business. She's there helping Naaman's wife. We don't know how old she is. We know as a maiden, she was younger, um, probably maybe, you know, pre-teenish, and, and little gives the idea that would be on the smaller side. So we're not talking 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. We're probably talking 10, 11, 12, 13, somewhere in that, that ballpark. And uh, here she is serving one day, and, and Naaman, this great and mighty man of valor, this man that when he walks in, people cower. When he leads his army into battle, other nations just surrender. They don't want to face him. Now he's struck with leprosy. He's helpless. He can't do anything. He can't go to the doctor. There is no cure. It is a terminal sentence. Well, the young maiden hears about this, and she says to Naaman's wife, think about this. A little girl taken from her home in a foreign country. It says, would to God that Naaman could go to the prophet of Samaria. If, if he, I, I just know, I have so much confidence in my God and in the man of God that he has there that if Naaman could get to him, I know that my God, through that man of God, could heal him. Do you, do you see the confidence in her? There was no question in her mind that her God was big enough. There was no question in her mind that God could intervene in Naaman's life. There was no question who was the man of God to send them to. You say, why? Here's Elisha. He was Elijah's understudy. If you remember right, and if you remember the story, um, Elijah told Elisha, uh, what is it that you want? And he said, could I have a double portion of God's hand on you on my life? Could, could I? I mean, that's a pretty bold ask, isn't it? I mean, we're talking Elijah. He says, I want to do for God double what you do. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we get a younger generation who would say to us as an older generation, I wish I could do double for God what you did in your life. By the way, if that happens, do not be jealous, do not be upset, say praise God. More can happen. And so here, here they, they are, and oh, by the way, 
If you study out scripture, Elijah did seven miracles. Elisha did 14. To the T, he did double what Elijah did. Well, she heard about him because remember when Elijah went up in the chariot of, of fire, you know, as he went up and he, he, as he came back, he, the mantle fell and he got Elijah's mantle and he got from the river that they had just crossed. And remember, he took that mantle and smacked the river and says, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And God said, here I am. And the water went, whoop. And he went, whoop. Okay. I don't know if in his mind he went, that's one. I don't know if he kept track. Hey, but if I asked God to get, let me do double what the other guy did, I'd be keeping track, wouldn't you? Well, maybe that's, I don't know if that's prideful or whatever, but you know, I'd be like, that's one. And she heard of all these miracles that he did. And so she, she says that to him. And, well, um, someone goes and tells Naaman. Naaman says, oh, there's someone that can do cure. So they go and tell the king of Syria. And the king of Syria writes a letter and says, let Naaman pass through and go to the king and tell the king this is what I want. And you see the king's reaction when he read that letter? <laughs> the king is like, who does he think I am, God? I can't give life. I can't heal. Did he send this to me? Uh, do you understand what he's saying? Did he send this to me to have a reason to, to have a fight with us? In other words, did he send him to me knowing I can't heal him? So when I don't heal him, then that king is justified to come in and wipe us out. Sounds to me like this nameless little maiden had more faith in her God and in the man of God in her home country than her own king did. And so here we have this going on. Well, eventually, word gets, if you uh, keep reading down, uh, word gets down to, um, look at verse 9. Verse 8, and it was so when Elijah, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, he was in mourning, that he said to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Word gets to Elijah that the king rent his clothes. By the way, that's a sign of national mourning. And so Elijah says, yeah, send him to me. He'll know there's a God in Israel. By the way, here comes this mighty man of valor with all these chariots, with all these horses, with a letter from his king to Elijah. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariots and stood at the door of the house of Elijah. Elisha. And Elijah sent a messenger on him saying, go and wash in Jordan. Seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Here is this world powerful figure standing at his door. Elijah doesn't even come to the door. Elijah doesn't even greet him. Elijah doesn't say, Hey, come with me down to the river, I'll show you where it is. No, Elijah says to his servant, Go give him a message at the door. Do we kind of get this picture? By the way, Naaman gets a bit bent out of shape. He does. He's like, who in the world is this Elijah that he couldn't even come to the door and talk to me? He had to send this messenger. Oh, and by the way, he wants me to go get to the Jordan. Have you seen that river? It's nasty. It's filthy. We've got clean rivers back in our country. If it's just dipping in a river, I would rather go to a nice river and dip. Till someone came to him and said, Naaman, please, please don't get mad. I don't know, maybe he's thinking, please don't get mad. I like my head on my shoulders. Because if you made the wrong, this guy mad. You know what I mean? Naaman, I'm Let's not get mad, but can I ask you something? If he would have asked you to do something of like great valor to be healed, would you have done it? Oh yeah, there's nothing I would not do to be healed of this leprosy. So what do you get to lose by going to the Jordan River and getting in 
and dunking seven times. Like, what do you have to lose? You know, sometimes when we have clear instructions from God, what do you have to lose for not obeying? Everything. Hey, if Naaman did not go into the Jordan River and did, if he did once, no healing. Twice, none. Three times, none. He had to get seven times. He did it. If you read the scriptures, he came down the sixth time, went down the sixth time, came back up, still full upper. But on that seventh time, he went down and he came back up completely full. Life changed. By the way, he, he, he did go back to Elijah's house and he tried to pay him. You remember all that silver and all that gold and all those changes of clothes that he brought? He tried to pay him for his services. And Elijah basically said, that was God who did it. I will not take anything from it. You can't buy God. Good advice, right? You can't buy God. God works. Let him take credit. They say, all right, and this is all good. And this is all well. And, and it's, you know, it's, to me, it's all because that Naaman needed more than just healing his leprosy. He needed to learn humility. He needed to learn to humble himself in the face of an almighty God. Sometimes for us, God has to humble us too, doesn't he? Many a times for someone to come to know Christ as their Savior, uh, they've got to hit what we would say rock bottom. God's got to take everything off of my brain and let them get a reality check who they really are. Well, we finally landed, as we said, he did this. Can you imagine what it would have been like to have leprosy? That everyone in the world would avoid you, want nothing to do with you, and then just like this, it was gone. It was healed. Look at verse 15. And he returned to the man of God, and he and all his company came and stood before him, and he said, Behold now, I know there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray that you take a blessing of thy servant. Ah, what an impact. He came back to the and said, you know what? I now know there is no God in the entire world, in all the earth, but your God. You say, why? He had already done everything in the world to get healed. And no one could do it. But he came to this one man in this one little hut that wouldn't even come to the door and see him. He said, I don't know there's only one God. Can I ask you a question this morning? How did all that take place? How did this mighty, powerful uh, leader of the army of, of one of the, the scariest, fiercest armies in the world, the Assyrian army, the Assyrian army were not nice armies. Like, they didn't mean things to people. They just kind of would steamroll, and they, would, they just wiped everything out, killed everything, took everything over. How did that man get to a point where he's sitting at this door, healed the leprosy, and saying, now I know there is no God in all the earth but your God? Want me to tell you how? One little nameless girl that we don't even know anything about, other than that she served his wife stood up and said, My God can do that. My God can change your life. My God can, can heal that. My God is the one who can. If I, if I can just get you introduced and connected to my God, my God will change your life. So, what can we learn from this? What are some applications? Well, the very first thing I see how this all came about is this young maiden, she was sensitive to the need of others. She was sensitive to the needs of others. As a slave, she could have been tempted. I mean, think it. I don't know about you. Maybe this is a, 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 a flaw in my character. If I were her age and I were in her spot, and I were taken from my home, and I were taken from my country, and I were forced to serve this mean general's wife, 
And she came in and said, I don't know what we're going to do. My husband has leprosy. Maybe not in front of her. Maybe when I went in my own private little place, sort of thing. I would have been like, yes! He got what's coming to him. If we look on some of your faces, you'd be there with me cheering. <laughs> look on some of your other faces, like, how dare you do something? Right? Let's be honest. I mean, would you not be excited? Would you not be like, I told you you were going to get it. You can't treat people like that and win. What goes around comes around. What you sow, therefore you also you reap. And you know, we get that, you know, ha ha. But is that how she reacted? No, you say, why? Something inside of her, something in this training back here at home instilled within her a care and concern for the well being of others. And you know what? That care and concern for the well being of others, she knew this. Ultimately, the best thing for anyone was for them to know her God. And she knew just the man to introduce him to him. And so she had this, this care and concern for others. She cared about those who cared little about her. She did not bury herself in her own suffering or even take pleasure in other people's pain. Can I tell you something this morning? We are surrounded in a world of hurting people. All around us are people experiencing the pains of broken homes, of physical illness, of loneliness, of abuse, of a, just keep the list going. All they really need is for someone not to have a big name, not to be famous, not to be rich, but for someone to just care. Someone to have a concern for them. Someone to just come along and say, you know what? I don't have the answers, but I know how to introduce you to someone who does. Hey, hey, Mrs. Damon, I, I, I don't have the answer to your husband's leprosy, and I can't do much about it, but I know my God can, and I know who my God using. So if I could just introduce the two of them, God can take care of the rest. And can I tell you something? Whatever, however someone's hurting the world today, can I tell you something? You know that God has the answer. If you're here this morning, you're know in the process and if you would just show a little bit of care, a little bit of concern. I heard someone say, he was talking to a group of, of young preachers, and he said this. He said to them, son, remember that whenever you preach, there is a broken heart in every pew, in every seat. That would change things. Remember, we need to be sensitive to the need of others. Can I say this? That type of concern does not naturally come naturally to most people. Therefore, we must work to develop an awareness of and a compassion for hurting people. I don't know about you, but naturally when you see, when you see someone hurting, you see, there's some problems. I think, they need, I, I think they need their space. But sometimes all they need is someone to come alongside them and say, listen, I don't have the answer, but I can tell you someone who does. I can care for you. I mean, I can't, I can't change anything, but I can be there with you. I can walk with you and introduce you to them. Hey, little girl, I can't, but, but, but if he could just get to Samaria, I, I know someone that God is using greatly that could do it. So she had a care and concern for us. Second thing we can learn this is she was a credible witness. Why would a general believe a little girl that they don't even know her name? Why listen to her? Read it. I mean, she was a slave. Why care what she said? If the slave girl had not been a good and faithful worker, do you think anyone would have listened to her? What if every day all of the people around her, all of Naaman's wife was heard her grumble and complain about how bad her life was and how horrible things are? Do you think in one moment, if all they ever heard 
word was, man, my life is miserable. I was taken from my family. And just complain, complain, complain. I don't know why God's doing this to me. And then all of a sudden, the next breath, I don't know why God's doing this to me. God can help you. And then you wonder why people won't listen. Hey, if your God can't help you, how is he going to help me? But she was a credible witness. We don't know a lot about how she served, but evidently I would say she would not be whinging and complaining all day. We could probably already, already assume that she trusted God, and it was evident she trusted God. Maybe we can even assume here that the joy of the Lord was her strength. Whatever it was, when she said, my God can help, she was believable. There was something about her life that when she said, my God is powerful enough to help, and his man there in Samaria, if you could get him to him, it would, it would work. Something about that testimony in that time that we don't know about. She was a credible witness. Can I ask you, if you do find someone hurting that you know, and you were to go to them and say, you know what, my God can help you, would you be a credible witness in their sight? Or they look at you and say, if your God can't help you because you're always miserable and complaining about how this, and you're asking, why is God doing this to me? Or why is God doing this to my family? Or why is God doing this to so-and-so? Or what in the world is God doing in the world today with all this craziness and, and all this uncertainty? And why is God giving us all this sickness? And why, blah, 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 blah. Oh, but God can help you. Are we a credible witness? Or when we say, my God can help you, and then we go, what? If he can't help you, how can he help me? Or would they say, you have a God? Why well, not? That's the first news I ever heard that you actually believe in God. She was a very credible witness. I mean, think about it. Why would he consider that long journey to find Elijah? I say it's this. Her genuine concern and integrity must have been obvious to Naaman and to his wife. Oh, why would they do it? Living a life of integrity helps us maintain credibility with those around us. People will trust you when they know that you are trust, truthful and honest. It is virtually impossible to teach the next generation to live a trustworthy life if we aren't actually modeling it. It's virtually impossible to tell people, you can trust God if you don't. We don't know who the parents of the servant girl were, but they'd evidently taught her that her testimony for God would enhance if she simply did the right thing did a good job, was kind to others, maybe kept her temper under control. She gained credibility because of how she lived her life in front of Naaman and his wife as a slave girl. Think about what we read, what Dave read at the beginning. Having a good testimony by those that are without. Naaman and Naaman's wife certainly were without Israel, were they not? And because this little girl had a good testimony with those that are without, when the time came, she could care for them. When the time came, she could tell them some things. And when the time came, they actually believed what she said. Third thing, she witnessed positive results. <laughs> she saw it happen. Now you can imagine the joy the servant girl felt when Naaman came. Can you imagine that? Naaman goes to Israel. He goes through all this stuff. He finally submits and humiliates himself. Dips in the Jordan River seven times. Comes up and he's completely clean. Goes through Elijah and it's like, whoo, there's only no other God on earth but that God. And I believe him and I'm his follower. And he comes, 
Can you imagine the servant girl's reaction when Naaman comes back and says, Thank you. You're right. There is no godly in God. Look at me. Look, look, just look, look. No leprosy. I'm fine. Thank you for caring. Thank you for being legal. Thank you for pointing me in the right direction. I don't know if you've ever been able to uh, see someone coming across your sitting room, but there's nothing like it. We cannot assume that, I mean, but think about this. We can't assume that much change in her life. She was now the servant of a human master. But she was still a servant. Correct? I mean, the Bible doesn't say he came back and released her back to her family and their life and they lived happily ever after. No, no, no. She now was a servant of a healed master. That, that, that was the difference. We don't even know her name. I mean, wouldn't it be nice to at least know who this was? I mean, this girl had such boldness for God that she stood there and told this most powerful man if you could just get here, and then it happened, and he was healed, and... Oh, who did that? That's a little baby. Can I tell you this? Often faithful witnesses receive no reward here on earth. They seem almost unnoticed. Even as everyone rejoices over the sinner's life that they've touched, they're unnoticed. You see, our job is to present Christ to people, not to make a name for ourselves. I read about a, a once a well-known preacher. He, he was a featured speaker at this big uh, church event. And the pastor got up to introduce him. And here's what he said. It almost seemed like a big ego boost and then a big poof of the balloon. You ready for it? Here's what he said. He said, today, you will meet someone who is known around the world. He has been instrumental in changing millions of lives. He, was called a, he is called a great teacher and a man of compassion. His name is Jesus Christ. And our speaker here is here to tell you about him. Yeah, can you imagine? All of, Here's a great speaker known all around the world. He changed millions of lives. You're going, yeah. And his name is Jesus, and he's here to tell you about it. But isn't that the way it should be? The best witnesses for God do not care about recognition. They only want to rejoice and see the gospel shared. So as we close out this morning, can I ask you this? What about your witness? Remember we said applications to live by What about your words? I read a story about a lady, and she was a teacher who was assigned to visit children in a large city children's hospital. She received a phone call on a particular, about a particular child, and the teacher took the boy's name and room number. And the teacher on the other end said, you need to go to this room and teach this boy about nouns and adverbs. That's exciting stuff, isn't it? Well, go teach him. About nouns and adverbs. That's, that's what they're learning in his class now. And she said, I'd be grateful if you could help him with his homework so he doesn't fall too far behind the others. Well, it wasn't until the visiting teacher got to the boys' room that she realized that the hospital bed number she was given was in the local furniture. She walked into his room and no one had prepared her to find a young boy who was horribly burned and in great pain. Once in the room, she we were gone into a hospital room and we're like, oh. and it's like you can't just turn around and walk out now. You know, I'm telling you, if you're in the hospital, I'll visit you. But please prepare me for when I visit you. Because when you walk into a hospital room, there is just some things that once you see, you're just like, oh. but you can't just like turn around and walk out. That's all. Right? So that was where she was. She, she came in and she saw him and was like, mm, couldn't turn around and walk out. She, he's kind of like went, I'm, I'm the hospital teacher. And 
And your teacher sent me to help you with your nouns and adverbs. Well, the boy was in so much pain, he could barely respond. The young teacher didn't know what to do, so what did she do? She taught him about nouns and adverbs. And she was kind of felt bad for putting him through this. Well, the next morning, a nurse on the bird unit asked her, what did you do for that boy in that room? But the teacher burst into apologies. She said, you understand. I, I didn't know what to do, and I was just I sat there teaching about nouns and adverbs. I saw the dish she was in, I just talked about nouns and adverbs. I am so sorry, and she's, and she's apologizing. The nurse interrupted her and said, you don't understand. We've been very worried about him. But ever since you were there yesterday, whatever you did, his whole attitude changed. He's fighting back. He's responding to treatment. It's as if whatever you did caused him to decide to live. Later on, when asked what happened, here's what the boy said. He said, they wouldn't send a teacher to work on nouns and adverbs to a boy who was dying. Would they? So I decided since they thought I wasn't going to die, I would. What happened? One person came back. Like this teacher and the slave girl in the story of Naaman, you too can be a witness. If people see Christ in you through your good works and the way that you live your life, they will more easily listen to you when you invite them to know Christ as their Savior, even when you invite them to church. Somebody has said that evangelism or witnessing for Christ is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but they say 90% of all church growth is experienced as the result of someone inviting a friend or a relative to church. What's the most effective way to see someone come to know Christ in their city? Invite them to church. It says, because of Jesus, we have the opportunity to be a part of the greatest task in the world. One life touching another life. Who touches another life? Who touches another life? And on and on it goes down to whenever the Lord decides to come back. This morning, can I ask you this? Do you know Christ as your Savior? Has someone pointed you to Him as this little girl pointed Naaman to God, the, to the man of God to introduce him? You haven't, can I tell you something? There's nothing greater you can do in the world than to come to the point where you accept Christ as your personal Savior. <clears throat> If you're here this morning and you know Christ is your Savior, can I ask you this? Are you letting your light shine? Do people know? I mean, when you start witnessing for, for God, do you have a credible witness? Because what they observe and what they hear line up. Or do they hear someone who's always complaining about, I can't believe God's done this and this and that, and then say, well, my God's powerful enough to save you. Hey, if your God can't handle your world, how is he going to handle theirs? Do you care about others? And are you willing to, to be a witness for him as this young lady was? You say, yeah, but, but, but we don't know who the lady was. And if I lead to the Lord, I want everyone to know. Well, then that's the wrong motive. It's not about you. It's not God. You say, but, I, I, but I, I, what if I don't get recognition? <laughs> uh, what's your name? What's your name? You say, I don't know. But we know this. Naaman may God. Because of, what's your name? Father, we come before this morning. And Lord, we thank you so much for this young lady that we, we don't even know her name, but Lord, more than likely one day when we get to heaven, she'll be there. 
Lord, I pray that you would help us to have this application of living by, to let our light shine, to be a witness for you. But Lord, may we do so as we are caring about others. May we do so as we have a credible testimony. May we do so as uh, we point folks to you and not really worry about recognition. Lord, may it just be one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And Lord, may we be a testimony for you in the world today. If at any time the world is hurting and needs concern and needs comfort and needs a Savior, it's now. That's why you've put us in this very point, in this very time in human history, to be able to make the greatest impact that we could make. Lord, I pray that you help us to apply these principles for this girl that we may never know her name. But Lord, you certainly help us change the world by just simply letting our light shine. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. and we will say, I will praise you. table. Uh, the forms are there. Just fill those out. Turn them into uh, Caitlin or my wife. And uh, we'll make sure that get that going for you. And uh, we look forward to seeing you back tonight. Five o'clock, we'll be having our evening service. Continuing our study of the book of Hebrews. Um, and we look forward to that time together as well as if you, for some reason you ever miss a service, just do remember. Uh, you can still go to our church's YouTube page and the 9 o'clock study, the 10-15 service, the 5 o'clock service, are all available there to be able to watch and to, to view and do all those types of things. Uh, that's available for you as well. And we look forward to seeing you back tonight, 5 o'clock. All right, let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning. Uh, thank you so much for the, the opportunity we have to be in your house. And Lord, again, we pray if anyone doesn't know you as your Savior, Lord, may they not leave without getting that settled. But those of us who do know you as our Savior, Lord, may we uh, let our light shine as this, this little girl did. May we make an impact for you. And Lord, may we be inviting people to church, introducing people to you, and Lord, just uh, showing real care and concern uh, for those around us. But Lord, we also pray that you help us to have our lives lit, match up to the message. 
Lord, may we not just say that you are a God who can do anything, who is in control, who you can trust, Lord, but may we actually be a people who trust you and who live out that trust in you, in you in each and every day of our lives. I'll be with us now as we go from this place, bring us back safely together tonight at 5. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.